uh, processing and the opinion of the general public on processing, which is according to uh, a fairly sizable percentage, useless or not uh, not truthful. But it, it, we found it to be really, really pretty good, but it does have its barriers. So there are two levels of vendors. Uh, it is interesting to note that they had rules. The, the rules between the contracting, between the uh, transportation vendors and the processing vendors are almost always pretty similar because they couldn't work well together. Uh, the national structure is a little mushy. Uh, a mix of governmental bodies, uh, the level city, state, and federal branches of government. Uh, across that mix, there are so similarities and differences in how how uh, processing, how uh, recycling is. is in the, the, I think the basic reason for those uncertainties are that we are a free country. We don't. We have difficulties between our levels of government and our agencies of government as to how to do things. And so naturally that's going to show up in recycling as well. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's based on can this be turned into a commodity that is uh, that you can make money. Can recycling, recycled materials be processed into something that can bring money. And can it bring money close enough to where it is uh, collected that it doesn't cost too much to get it compared to So those, those are all barriers on the standard recycling stuff. Uh, Oakno, as far as basic recycling, is fairly uniform across our two campuses. We have different transport vendors. ABC and Johnny Refuse, but they both use the same processing and, and so the rules are the rules are quite similar. I won't go into those. Uh, you've got your paper and I suppose uh, online uh, information on what you can and what you got uh, cannot recycle. Uh, the bulk of the course is paper, cardboard. Triangulated plastics, that's my term for the little triangle symbol on the plastics. Uh, aluminum and steel cans, exclusions between the two sides are similar. Things like food waste, dirty pizza boxes, uh, uh, and anything not on the transport vendor's list. So, read. Uh, there is I, I'm sure on our side of <coughs> both campuses, you'll find a fairly large percentage of residents who might have looked at the, at the leaflet when they moved in seven years ago or whatever, but we haven't paid too much attention to it. Surprisingly, they pick up, pick up through practice uh, pretty well over time. Uh, one, one thing I would encourage in all of this is it's, it's complex, but this is a group of people who have dealt with complex issues most of their careers. That would be my hands, and, and you can, but it's, the question is, do you want to? I mean, you, you try and back off a little bit, you know, take things a little easier, but it, it's worthwhile. And so, my main uh, point in, in the recycling part of this, beyond recycling, is don't bail and don't dump. By bailing, I mean putting stuff in trash that can go in recycling. The kind of bailing on the issue. Don't dump, just don't put trash into recycling. Either one doesn't do as much good. Uh, probably the most uh, uh, apparent 
problem would be putting trash in the recycling. But we do need to keep the volume. Uh, we, when I took over from Wetherill, who preceded me at, at Oakville as uh, chair of, uh, of recycling, uh, we had about eight bins a week. And we now have possibility of 26. We have at least uh, 19 or 20 every week. So we can't think of volume. So that's, that's recycling. What are the goals of recycling? Very simple, minimize land use. Don't be eating up land. Uh, water, land and water reservation. And avoidance of losing materials already mined and manufactured. And uh, uh, so many reasons for doing recycling. But the same goals that apply to recycling also apply to beyond recycling. There's a lot of stuff that's invented to contract it to not know. So naturally, there are a lot of things that we can do that, uh, that would increase the, the, the uh, and improve our ability to achieve those goals, the same goals we have for recycling. Uh, the parts that I will talk about are uh, the fact that we actually inspect every plastic grocery bag to see if it has holes in it. And then direct it to where it can be reused. Uh, it seems like, you know, there are a lot of activities for something not not too good, but that's one more plastic bag that for at least one time is not going into the ocean or uh, what a barbed wire or fence or whatever. I don't understand what you mean, Carl. What plastic bags? Grocery bags. Yeah, I know, but all the, all the grocery bags that come into Oak Mill? That, bring, that are brought down into? There, there's a bin down in the uh, spring recycling
cartridges, uh, and, and a lot of other things that we have uh, electronics too. Uh, there are places in town that will take operational or non-operational uh, electronics. Uh, we, they, they wind up on tables in, the, in our recycling room, and uh, we, we try to see that they don't go in the trash. They're, they're, they're really not very good at running Eyeglasses to Walmart. Just some, some examples of the things that, uh, that we do. Uh, now, uh, a, a bit of a warning. I don't know how, how you intend to uh, handle this if you come to this, but the point is that individuals can do these things. It, you, you, you could go ahead and take some of that time. So, but if you have a plan and you're going to try and do this kind of centrally, it requires volunteers to gather the materials. It requires, it requires space to gather them and hold them until they are being transported by somebody. But the, the benefit of it is if you all go out individually do these things, even if you all did your part, that'd be a lot of travel. But if you've got a little space to store this stuff for a few weeks, or even a few days, and go out with just one person making the trip, it's, it's a lot more efficient. Now, Mary will uh, uh, knock your socks off. And how do they find somebody who needs them? Right? <laughs> yeah, right. The emphasis here is twofold. That, that, uh, that well, I forgot one more, but it's reuse. That's just one, one example of reuse. And it is definitely beyond recycling because socks can't go. No fabric can go to recycling. So I'll hear from Mary now. I don't have any socks on my way. May I ask another question of sure. you, Carl? Yep. You, said, you said that both our site and West use the same processor, processing vendor. No. So, yes.
is where I take them often because they do crafts, of course, with kids. And uh, years ago, well, I don't know, four or five or six, I did a lot of volunteering at Hoover, the old Hoover where my grandson uh, was. And they, let's see if I can move here, they uh, did a giant squid <laughs> with the cardboard tubes. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was very neat. It hung way at the top of the library for a long time. I don't want you to think about a giant squid when you're using your cardboard tubes, but um, that was such a neat reusing, I think, that they uh, did with the tubes. Um, some other things I have there, we have a, an artist over in uh, the George Building, Kate Bull, you may know her. She was a pandemic king. She told me that she, one of the things when she had to, you know, sort of be at home a lot, she went through a lot of her old paintings and she started cutting them up into, um, into for one thing, um, bookmarks. So she made all, a lot of times she added new designs to the bookmarks and she's got them in a container down in our little, um, outside the grocery store that we have over at Old Home House. And she's done over 400 of these oh. in the last year or so. And she even had a uh, resident send her a photo that um, her granddaughter in Belgium was excited about getting one of these bookmarks. So they're, they're really a popular item. And she also um, made Kate did. This is, these are some of her paintings that she, you know, she started with her painting and then she'd take pieces, things out of the newspaper and off of napkins and puts them on the old painting and makes new paintings out of them. I think that's so clever. And then this one is one that she's going to give to the Historical Museum because she had an old painting and this is, reflects the, the pandemic. She added this sort of COVID ball there and some of the, you know, pieces she found in the newspaper, for instance. So I, I think that too was such a clever reused project that she did. Um, uh, I worked a lot with table. Table had been for 24 years now. So I uh, have a pretty good knowledge of where food can go that, uh, and I know what is safe to take places. And on the food service, I get text messages from Juan or, or Bruce. They'll say, you know, we have leftover food from Christmas in the old kitchen. Can you pick it up? So I arrange to go pick it up, and I then make sure I take it to a place it can be used. Usually the free lunch program, but sometimes shelter house, sometimes uh, hate camp on South Gate just wherever it can be used. I know how to get in touch with those places pretty quickly, just to double check that they can use what I have. Um, egg cartons. You all collect egg cartons, and that's something we collect too. And for the most part, I, they go to Six Acre Farms, which is a small operation out, out, out near Parnell. Sometimes I get a text message from Ida Miller down near Kelowna, and she'll say, do you have any egg cartons? And if I do, then I put them out in, my ex in the entrance of my building, and she'll pick them up. But, but for the most part, they go to Six Acre Farms. I pick them up from, um, well, my relatives in town, uh, from other people in town, from Lucille puts them out here for me to pick up. So I, and then we have a lot of them that collect over on our campus. About every three weeks, I collect about 100 egg cartons. And I just want to read you what Nicole Dawson at Six Acre Farm said. She said, yes, it saves us 25 to 30 cents per carton. There is also a carton shortage, so we are also having challenges in finding a good source of cartons. With so many shortages in the supply chain, it not only saves dollars, but also a lot of time finding cartons. There just aren't a lot of resources for the small farmer like us. So
So we're, you know, it's a, it's a neat thing, I think, that we can help that small farmer uh, just by collecting our used carbon. Yep, Shane. Do, do, does the kitchen at the mill left contribute cartons, or do they get them in cartons? Do they get them in something else? Yeah, I think they get them, you know, in the big uh, right. boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, we're uh, collecting, hemp. I have a bin on the table over there in the spring recycling room, to collect empty uh, water bottles with lids. And uh, when I, one of my stops at the community, that community, the food bank for table to table, one of the workers reminded me that in the past I had brought those bottles there, and then they used them to package detergent to give to their clients because sometimes you get detergent in giant, you know, containers, and then these small water bottles enable them to uh, portion it for their clients. Uh, yes, plastic grocery bags. Uh, Carl told you uh, what we do with those, and as I say, we have a volunteer who goes through every single one to make sure it's clean and not ripped, and then another volunteer takes them to open heartland for uh, the food bank. And uh, I'd also like to uh, encourage everybody, if they like dogs, these are great grocery bags. <laughs> I, I, I wish we could come up, you know, I think we'll try again harder to get um, people to, you know, get their own grocery bags that they can reuse because uh, when you, I mean, when I go past IV, I don't typically shop there, but the carts are coming out of that store filled with plastic bags. It looks like there are two or three things in each bag, you know, so I, I don't know, that whole plastic bag, uh, Thing is sort of out of control, I think. But anyway, I wish we could encourage people to carry that and use their own. Um, vases. I don't know about over at your place, but we get to have a lot of people receiving flowers. And we collect the vases over there. And um, they, uh, Josiah, who's our environmental uh, services chair, he collects them in a box outside his office. And then, um, this is from Kathy Vance. She's the lead receptionist. She said, Josiah takes care of holding on to them until we get several boxes of them. And then I call every blue thing. And they come and pick them up. Not only saving the environment, but this saves the business money as they are reusing them. Yep? Every blue thing will pick up here as well. Oh, good. Uh, I've given the bottles to Katie, and she collects them. Oh, good. Yeah. I think that's, that's a, um, I think we all got a mug from Hills Bank. Yeah. With yeah. those flowers when we moved in. Yeah. And she's collected those and given them back to every woman thing. Yeah. Yeah, and again, it's a way to help a, a small local business, and that's always a good thing. Uh, books, when we have uh, books left out in our recycling room. Um, they go to the three libraries. Uh, we have a free library now at uh, Hope Mill, Maine, but uh, when I checked with Jane Welch, who's out of city's recycling coordinator, I found a lot of books that I found in the department. I also help uh, Hope Mill residents and their families clear apartments or rooms when they have to move because I've been doing that sort of thing for years anyway, so I just kept doing it when I moved to Oakville. But, um, so the book, Jane Welch suggested books going to the free libraries, especially on the southeast side. But now Shelter House is having their in-person book sale again this year. So the books will be going to the Shelter House sale. If their books are not in good shape, then on one of my runs out to the landfill, I take them to the box where they collect um, hard cover books that need to be recycled. Uh, hangers. The plastic ones go to, um, oh, well, you know the plastic hangers. What <laughs> <laughs> I like to do is do it. <laughs> so, the plastic ones, um, 
this time. Again, to Messiah and environmental services, they really need them there for a health center and assisted living laundry. So we take all of our plastic containers to Josiah's office. Um, now these, these, of course, I run across when I'm there in departments and so forth. So, but it might be helpful. We um, for you to know too. Um, ones like this take the paper off and recycle the paper. One like this take the cardboard and recycle the cardboard. The metal uh, I take Peterson's. Uh, metal recycling out of Pearlton. It's handy there. They have a little dumpster right there in the entrance. You can just drive up there and put your metal right into that little dumpster. Unless you have some big eggs, but usually I just have these small things. Rachel will recognize this. This is a apron from Oakville Food Service. They contacted me and said, we don't need a bunch of aprons. So now these are the aprons we use for our Oakville free lunch team. So those are getting reused by Oakville residents down in the free lunch kitchen. So we have our serving day. Um, all sorts of packaging. You know, bubble wrap, uh, those little plastic pouches, all of that. Um, I collect all of those. When I, I, we don't really have a collection spot for them. But when I find them, Unfortunately, in the recycling bin, sometimes I pull them out, or when they're just laying down in the recycling room, mailboxes is happier when you use all that cash, bubble wrap, whatever. So I just take it there whenever I collect a bunch of things. I was stumped by a question from one of the residents here yesterday. It was a very, very large uh, uh, sheet covering a new mattress, uh, a plastic a plastic sheet. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I shouldn't say sheet, it, it was just a large plastic bag that was fit over oh, right. uh, a mattress. Where would something like that go? Hmm. Well, actually, I say really large plastic bags that put a car back. Because when I set them out in the entrance, it's so handy to have a big plastic bag that I can put eight cartons in for well, them to pick up. This is so, so that makes the size of a mattress. Yeah. I don't offhand. I can't. Okay. Think of how it could be reused. Did you have a suggestion? Yeah. There are people who came and talked from houses and the homes they were in. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> Selena, uh, I'm, they're picking up things from three different apartments at the main thing on Friday morning. If, do you have one of those now that you want to give me? I can add it to a minute. I, I told them to just my knowledge and had to just go in the trash. Yeah, so but that's a good suggestion to check with HA. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I don't know. It's a good way to make your question. Partly used cleaning supplies, again, when I clear apartments and so forth, um, often there are partly used cleaning supplies in the kitchen and, and bathroom and cupboards. Um, those, I find, um, are often wanted as open heartland. They give them to their, you know, the people that come there for other supplies. And also sometimes to the woman down at uh, KCAP on Southgate, who's responsible for cleaning apartments that KCAP owns in town. So I can almost always find a place for partly used cleaning supplies. And if not, then they go out to hazardous waste and they have a swap shop out there, as you probably know. So um, people can go out there and get partly used cleaning supplies. Pull tabs. We have a we have a container down in our recycling room for the pull tabs, you know, from pot and soup cans. And um, our volunteer takes those to around the ground house, uh, you know, when the jar gets full. And I found this uh, interesting from the Ronald McDonald's house website. The pull tab 
Christ are bled and then recycled at Marion Iron Company. The tab contains more aluminum than the entire can. At a recycling rate of 30 cents to 60 cents per pound, it takes about 235 pounds of pop tabs to cover the cost of caring for a family of one night for one night at Ronald McDonald House. And I thought this was kind of a fun fact. 
you know, in the, they have on their website the directions for packaging the bottles to take there. And we were doing that. We had volunteers taking them to camp shed for redeeming. And then that became really, we couldn't find volunteers. It, you know, there were five or six um, banana boxes at a time of bottles to take to camp shed. We didn't have volunteers who could manage it. So now we are putting glass into our recycling uh, carts because our vendor takes glass. Oh, do you know ours? No, 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 Sarah, that's the problem. No. Yours doesn't, yeah. Your vendor doesn't take glass. Your recycling vendor. Yeah. So I thought we had the same vendor who processed. Yeah, it's the not same processor, but not the same transport. So it's right. a transport. Right. That's uh, the right. problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the cans, uh, we do redeem uh, lots of the big bags of cans and plastic bottles. I usually take them over there. And um, it used to be in past years that we saved up all the money we got from redeeming and gave it to Shelter House. It would be about a thousand a year, wasn't it, mm -hmm. Carl? And, but uh, when this pandemic got going, I was taking those, you know, big bags of cans and bottles over there, and I saw the conditions under which those people are working. And I've been putting all the money into their tip jar ever since this pandemic started. I, you know, nobody, I don't know anybody that would do a job like that. It's so dirty, and the way people, they are treated sometimes, you know, when I'm there, I can see the way some of the people that come there treat those employees, and so, and I, I was in a meeting and I mentioned this, and Steve Rose at that meeting, and he nodded his head, so I think what I'm doing is okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would just like to um, announce that um, I'm a member of the Iowa City AM Rotary Club. Uh-huh. And for years, our Rotary Club had a can shed at the North Dodge um, Recycling Center. And now that it, it has moved to the um, Riverside, South Riverside Drive, um, the can shed is not ready yet, but probably within two months, there will be a rotary can deposit shed at the Riverside Recycling Center. And you just dump them in. Um, all kind, all sizes of cans and plastic bottles. They just have to be the ones that can be created mm -hmm. for money. Mm -hmm. So nothing, but not glass. Yeah. I was out at a uh, restore one day because I know they have that. Don't, does the brewery have a uh, receptacle out there for accepting medium uh, waste? Restore Habitat? East side? Yeah. I can't hear. Uh, Habitat Restore? Yeah, yeah. they used to. Oh, they don't have that. Well, they have, isn't that what people say? It is still, no, the well, East no, side is sure. separate. It is still there. Yeah. But they don't, they don't handle large volumes. Oh. But once the, the Riverside site is set up in a couple in a month or so, that's probably a really good place to dump your cans. And will, they, will they accept them in bags? I mean, because we... No, you just put them in the... Oh, well, we just have so many at a time. Dump them through the... I guess we can dump them out of bags. Yeah, you know, you can, you can certainly recycle them yourself and take a bag. But what Rotary does is they... They sort everything that goes into that can shed and then take them to, um, to the can shed. And all of the proceeds for that goes back to grants to Iowa City. The Rotary Club doesn't keep any of the money. It all goes out to grants for community 501c3s. Yeah, when are they going to have that, did you say? There's, when are they going to have that? Down there? Well, they're redoing an old shed right now, and oh. we think within two months. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be a good place for us to take <coughs> up. Yeah, a really good place. Yeah. 